we're going to have a, uh, a one-hour case discussion forum, and this will give you the opportunity to uh, look at how real cases are handled uh, in different parts of the world, and you'll hear different opinions from myself and Dr. De Soma here in Italy and Jorge Cerda from the United States, and I'm sure Claudio will have his own opinions about things, and we will also ask you for your opinion about these cases, so I hope that you will find this uh, interesting. Started actually with uh, a case that last night I had number four, but I'll put it in number one. Um, this is an 81 year old Italian born lady. This is in Melbourne. Like every Italian born lady, she's only 150 centimeters tall. Uh, she has a past history of hypertension and non insulin dependent diabetes. Her baseline creatinine is 130 micromoles per liter and she has been admitted for elective surgery and her preoperative blood pressure is 160 over 90 millimeters of mercury. So Monday afternoon, she has an elective knee replacement operation at 3 p.m. Everything goes well and she is admitted to the ward. Uh, she's reviewed by the surgeon on Tuesday morning in the orthopedic ward and she looks well uh, she's having some uh, breakfast. The knee looks okay. There's no really has, uh, any major problem. And uh, everything looks quite fine. However, when she's reviewed by the nurses at 1 p.m., uh, they notice that she actually hasn't passed any urine at all. At all, since she came back from the operating theater. So it's now almost 20 hours when she hasn't voided her blood. Uh, the observations at the time is that her blood pressure is 90 over 60. She is looking quite comfortable. There are no problems. She's alert, cooperative. She feels fine. She's in no pain. She's very comfortable. But she says, I don't need to pass any urine. Thank you very much. Uh, the nurses perform a bladder scan, and the bladder is empty. They order some blood tests, and her creatinine is 201 micromoles per liter, and her white's account is 18,000. The orthopedic doctor doesn't, doesn't know what to do about this, uh, so he instructs the nurses to call the nephrologist on call and they make a telephone call to the nephrologist at 2 p.m., and the nephrologist asks them to give a liter of saline intravenously, um, as rapidly as can be done, to be followed by one liter over two hours by twice uh, doing that, and then follow up with an infusion over four hours to be continued for eight hours. And to insert an indwelling urinary catheter. So, Jorge, what do you think about this? Um, first question would be, what are the medications that she's got? How much of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory okay, That's a dose? very good question. Has she received non-steroidal drugs? And the answer is, she did. She received paracoxid during the operation prior to surgery. Uh, but she's not on non-steroidal drugs at the moment, other than, than that. And she is not on any other drugs at the moment except uh, her oral hypoglycemic agents and some narcotics for pain. Oh, yeah. She's a diabetic type 2. Uh, do you have any idea how much was creatinine before? So the, the preoperative pre creatinine was 130 micromoles per liter. And she's a very small lady, uh, quite rotund, uh, not much muscle mass, so her estimated GFR I don't have, but would not have been normal. Would not have been normal. Okay. Yeah, Claudio, you want to comment? Hemoglobin is normal, 10, nothing particularly abnormal. Yeah. No, she's on, uh, no, she's not on metformin. She's on a different agent. I can't 
can't okay. remember. So the question was. where it was metformin and what if the hemoglobin has changed because uh, the blood pressure goes down like this and... Uh, very, very little. So there's no evidence, be. that's very reasonable. Okay. There's no evidence of bleeding and, and the hemoglobin is stable and she's not on metformin. Okay. One last thing. Yep. Lactate. We don't know yet. Okay. We don't know yet. One comment to make is that uh, sometimes uh, I think that Claudio's question is very important because a lot of patients who have knee surgery or uh, hip surgery yeah. can bleed enormous amounts of volume into the thigh and clinically they look okay. So the, the thigh can hide quite a bit of blood. In the yeah, it's a very, very good comment, absolutely. So you always have to worry in a hypotensive person that there may be bleeding. So at 8 p.m., uh, we, so we don't know anything about this woman. We, we work in intensive care, so we're just sitting here having a cup of coffee and we're just kind of chilling. But, but at 8 o'clock in the evening, we receive a medical emergency team call to the ICU. And the reason is now is her respiratory rate is above 30. Uh, her heart rate is 100 beats per minute. And she is dyspneic. Uh, she's wheezing. Uh, she is requiring more oxygen to maintain an o adequate oxygen saturation, uh, and uh, they want us to review the patient. So we go and see the patient, and she has uh, moderate respiratory distress. Uh, she has bilateral wheezing on auscultation. Uh, her blood pressure is 90 over 50. It's otherwise a kind of obese lady. Uh, her urinary output has been 120 mils over the last hour uh, in response to the interventions that have been uh, instigated. And we organized for her to have a chest x-ray. The chest x-ray shows early acute pulmonary edema. Uh, the ECG, which we order, or an EKG for the Americans, shows no evidence of ischemia or any changes from the pre-operative ECG. Uh, being ICU, we get the ultrasound and we do a transthoracic uh, echo. It's difficult to get good views uh, because of her size and body habitus. Uh, there are no obvious major abnormalities of left ventricular, right ventricular function, but she does have clear evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy consistent with her history of uh, previous hypertension. So we, we make the diagnosis that she, at this stage, has likely iatrogenic pulmonary edema in the setting of acute on chronic, acu uh, of acute on chronic kidney injury. Before you go on, uh, this is in the ICU, and of course, the nephrologist has probably not come um, yet. No. But, uh, but the first thing that the nephrologist would do is to get some urine and look at it in the microscope. Sure. Uh, because that urine would be very informative, and up until now we have the echo, but we don't know what it really looks like. Yeah. So if we see early brown granular cast in the sediment, then the idea that this patient has uh, acute kidney injury with uh, acute tubular necrosis in the early stages would be re very relevant, and this is a lady who probably, like you were saying, had some degree of proteinuria prior to the episode, so that information would be useful. And perhaps I would like some uh, electrolytes in the urine. Okay. If the ICU can give me that. Um, <laughs> so that, that's very reasonable. We didn't do any urinary microscopy, and we didn't measure any electrolytes in the yeah, urine. It, it, and that is all too common, and of course, it's, it's a problem, because I think sure. that you looking at the urine would be important. Can I also have a white count and maybe procalcitonin? So the white count is, uh, the, the, we, the one is we had was uh, of the morning, or the afternoon, was 18,000 which was elevated. And what else did you want to know? Well, uh, hypotension. Yeah. With white count. Yeah. Maybe platelet count would be a nice tool. Uh, I start having the problem that uh, a sneaking sepsis may start, and sure. I would like to have procalcitonin. So we didn't measure procalcitonin, okay. so I can't Normally tell you, but do. the platelet count was normal. I, I fully agree with the, with the Claudio on this hypothesis, also because although 
she's not febrile, but she's an old woman. So I'm not surprised that you can have a sepsis there without fever. So I think it's also important to remark that the fever at these patients many times does not appear. That's very true, very true. Any comments from the audience? Any other comments from anyone out there? Okay, let's continue. So, uh, yep. in, the, in, the, in the imaging, you did the echo. Can we have some imaging of the kidneys or? We didn't okay. do that, so I, I cannot comment. Yeah, but it would have been very, I'm sure it would have been very reasonable, but we didn't do that. Didn't. The other thought in terms of the, of the uh, possible sepsis is that these elderly ladies who are diabetic not infrequently have bladder incontinence and urinary tract infections to begin with, so urosepsis will be very high. Yeah, that, that's very reasonable. Yeah. Okay, now, just to make a kind of evaluation of the total thoracic fluid uh, content or overload. In this case, uh, it's not difficult to just to, to check the vena cava dimension. Uh, that would be important to see if the fluid is uh, circulating because I suppose that she got a lot of a fluid into 24 hours before and uh, no urine. So it's important where is the fluid. I think all is in the thorax and also, uh, let's say, chest thorax uh, uh, echo should be important to uh, evaluate the amount of a fluid. So we tried to get an IVC uh, diameter, but we couldn't technically succeed. She was a bit uncomfortable, quite fat, couldn't really get a good view, and, and she was in respiratory distress, and we, we backed off. So that's a very reasonable, reasonable comment. So what would you do now? There, there are, yeah, go on. Oh, comment. there's comments. Great. Yeah. There's one thing I, I was thinking of, uh, since she's from orthopedics, pulmonary embolism should be in your differential diagnosis also. Okay, so she's a potential pulmonary embolist, absolutely. So she's only day one and a half. Uh, the echo doesn't show any evidence of right ventricular dilatation. That doesn't mean you can exclude it, but that's a very reasonable comment. Yeah. So, um, we, we now, she's been in intensive care now for about uh, 30, 45 minutes. We've got the information that, that you've heard about. Um, and just to remind you where we are, so she has some tachypnea, uh, she has a degree of hypotension, uh, and uh, she has a degree of uh, pulmonary congestion. Uh, what would you do next? Would you consider giving her uh, albumin to improve blood pressure? Would you worry about her glucose control and implement uh, intensive insulin therapy? Would you start an inotropic drug? Would you monitor her cardiac function more closely? Would you consider intubation in this patient? Would you start a glycerol trinitrate infusion to deal with the congestion? Would you call the surgeon to say that she might be in early septic shock? What would you do? Or, or other possibilities, what would you do? What was that? Ferozamide. Okay. Yep, we're assuming the surgeon knows what septic shock is. That's a dangerous assumption with orthopedic surgeons. It is true. <laughs> We can explain it to him, yeah. And also, Rinaldo, it's not a bad idea but, but give albumin and then furosemide if yeah. you uh, need to know if albumin is low, because uh, that yeah. is important. I will never give albumin if the albumin is uh, normal. I would go to the furosemide to yeah. see. So an option is to give uh, furosemide, absolutely. But in, yeah. in, in this situation, what you want to achieve is to get perfusion pressure in the plant. Yeah, perfusion pressure, yeah. So uh, the butamine may have the benefit of sustaining the circulation and keeping the pressure uh, uh, at the kidney level. Because if you give the furosemide, you have the risk that blood pressure goes down farther without any uh, benefit to the kidney. This looking also into the perspective of the next 24 to 48 hours. Sure. So you've got uh, some competing situations. You've got the patient's hypotensive. You've got the patient who might uh, uh, benefit from diuresis because they are uh, 
uh, in a state of pulmonary congestion clinically and on the chest x-ray. So you have to choose what to do. Maybe they've got pulmonary embolism, but we think probably not. Maybe they're septic. We are not sure. Uh, maybe they're, they've just got non-steroidal inflammatory drug-induced changes in a diabetic patient with a low perfusion pressure and a little bit of inflammation, all sorts of multifaceted events. Any comments from the audience? Anything else? Uh, so we've heard fruzamide. Yep. Arterial line. Arterial line. Okay. Get, get blood pressure with an arterial line. That's an intensivist talking out there. That's cool. Yep. Any other comments? Non-invasive ventilation. Yeah, before you think about intubation. Use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation for pulmonary congestion. Yeah, about this uh, comment that I, I fully agree, you must check uh, blood pressure. Yeah. In, in case of non-invasive ventilation you know, that should be useful in this patient, you must check the systolic blood pressure that can go down because of that. Sure. So you have to have invasive blood pressure monitoring and non-invasive ventilation. Okay. I would defend again the, the, the idea of giving her diuretics for two reasons. One is that we may avoid having to intubate her, yep. and what's taking her to the ICU is the acute respiratory distress. So that is the key. The key at this point, the only thing that you care about is avoiding intubation, and also yep. it'll help me as a trial. Right. She does respond to a yep. sizable dose of furosemide, then the situation is not too bad. If she doesn't respond, then she didn't, and you need to do something. So, you know, a trial of fruzamide to try and get things going. Yeah. I would like to discuss this case with the treating physician. And my question to the treating physician, which is you in this case, is you are dealing with a patient that is in pulmonary edema and has a blood pressure of 90 over 50. Yeah. So are you assuming that she is overhydrated or are you assuming that you have a cardiac dysfunction or are you assuming that the hypotension is due to vasodilatation? What is your guess? So my guess is that she has iatrogenic pulmonary edema from the administration of saline in the beginning there. Okay. Right. And so that, that is my guess, that she's extravascular fluid overloaded with Why pulmonary edema. Why is blood edema. pressure 90? Ah, I don't know. I don't know yet. But for sure, if you assume that this is iatrogenic, pulmonary edema due to fluid infusion and overload in patients with a kidney injury that doesn't get rid of the fluid, you must assume that you either have a cardiac dysfunction or you have vasodilatation. Absolutely. So you either have a septic shock or you have a cardiogenic shock. Uh, oh. uh, this is a very good point, uh, Claudio, but I think you can have a both. In this situation, I think you can have a pulmonary edema because of your too much infusion of saline, but the kidney was not properly functioned, and the reason of the hypotension should be linked to septic shock or, or sepsis at this point. So I think the two things can be coexisting in these patients. It's quite possible, yeah. And patient, the we I love this thing. This is great fun. You can you can see how real medicine is complicated, uncertain, diagnosis are difficult, yeah. it's real time, minute by minute, and lots of options, and none of them immediately and clearly, obviously right. Please keep on going. Well, there is also a kind of, uh, let's say, um, difference between a case that you see in slide and the case course, that you no, touch. Of course, of For course. example, uh, of the course. perception of the status of hydration of this lady is not clear, and uh, in absence of other things, we do bioimpedance, for example, to have an idea. That seems totally reasonable, uh, but absolutely. So all that we know about this lady's volume state is that her fluid balance is now positive because she has received the saline prescribed, and it's positive about three liters. And she's a small lady, 150 kilos, but large, and that she has a chest X-ray consistent with pulmonary congestion. That's, that's all we know. In Fira Vena Cava, we cannot visualize. There is no edema. And the jugular 
pressure, we cannot assess because her neck is really big. She's had too many balls of spaghetti, and I just can't work it out. So the, the issue here is really, uh, does the increase in preload uh, improve the cardiac output, right? Sure. And does that result in an improvement in hemodynamics and the blood pressure? Uh, it, most likely, this is a lady who is uh, stocky, uh, long-standing hypertension, probably some underlying some degree of microvascular coronary artery disease. She's got to have a very stiff ventricle. And essentially, she's developing acute pulmonary edema in a ventricle that is non-compliant. Uh, and, and that will be my, my reason why the, uh, the forward pressure is uh, low and that perhaps unloading the situation may paradoxically improve. This is absolutely true also because she got the left ventricular hypertrophy to the echo. So, I mean, you're right. It's diastolic dysfunction due to the fact that it's a hypertrophic heart. Yeah, that all seems reasonable. Claudio? One question for the benefit of the fellows to the intensivist. Is the test... Uh, called stroke volume variation useful in this condition? Well, for stroke volume variation, you need to be mechanically ventilated. I, she's not mechanically ventilated at the moment, and so it's not possible to use that for dynamic assessment of uh, fluid responsiveness. Yeah. Okay, well, that, that's a pretty cool discussion. So that's what's going to happen in the next uh, 60 minutes. So all, all the intravenous fluids were stopped. Uh, we started non-invasive ventilation. Uh, we inserted a femoral central venous catheter. We inserted a radial arterial line. And we connected the arterial line to pulse contour technology. It's a flow track device, which is available. And that gave us an estimated cardiac index of three liters per minute per meter square. We started her on noradrenaline to increase her blood pressure in the knowledge that her cardiac index was adequate. And we restored a blood pressure of 120 to 60 with 12 micrograms per minute of noradrenaline. And we gave her a frusamide bolus of 120 milligrams, which was followed by a continuous frusamide infusion at 40 milligrams an hour. Any comments from the audience? We still don't have a diagnosis, right? Stay with me, we still don't have a diagnosis. But this is just the physiological management that's been initiated. Yeah, well, no, no major disagreement, no major disagreement. Cloud is busy with his iPhone, so that must be good. Any, any comment, yeah. So what, what was her ECG like? Was it so the ECG was the same as the preoperative ECG, which showed mild left ventricular strain pattern, which was consistent with the history of hypertension and which was consistent with the echocardiography findings of LVH. In her rhythm, she was not... She's uh, in sinus. She's in sinus tachycardia. A heart rate of 110, 140. Yeah. A troponin? We did order a troponin, but we don't don't have it yet. Yeah. That's absolutely reasonable. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. More comments? Yeah. Just to go back uh, for diagnosis, I ask for you. Uh, we have a, uh, maybe a rapidly progressive renal failure. Yeah. yeah pretty okay. Much, uh, Do you have any serological data on uh, immunoglobulin, C3, C4? No. Anca no. None was ordered. No. We didn't order it, and I don't, no, no, we don't. Okay, and... Uh, Legitimate and question, but we didn't do it. And protein reactive C? Uh, we did order it, and it was elevated. It was about 45, 50. It was, you know, moderately elevated, yeah. Okay. But we didn't know how to interpret it, because she just had surgery. No, just Difficult to know, yeah. Yes, okay. Claudio keeps on saying, do procalcitonin. The lactate, I think it's going to come up. It wasn't particularly elevated. I think it's, it's going to come up in a minute, but it wasn't particularly elevated from memory, yeah. Claudio keeps on doing, do procalcitonin, but we didn't. Yep. So I think uh, she probably has just an inflammatory response, massive inflammatory response from the surgery, so she's just vasodilated. 
and she would need adequate filling and vasopressor support for 24 to 48 hours, wait until the cytokine inflammation settles and, and her pressure would regulate herself. The key thing is to make sure during this time that we maintain organ perfusion and not make her more hypovolemic. I would rather intubate her rather than diurise her under these circumstances, if so needed. Comments here, it's inflammation, relax, is that knee surgery? Uh, okay. Maintain organ perfusion and cardiac output and chill. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention whether she is or not on antibiotics. She is being started on antibiotics. Yes. R Rinaldo, we, I think we, we, did, did. we did give her empirical antibiotics. We'll come to that. So yeah. we can even not exclude that she has pneumonia. We can't. We cannot exclude. We can't. We agree. We agree. She is uh, uh, obese. Yeah. Uh, really, and uh, respiratory distress. You can have pulmonary edema, but uh, you cannot check the possibility of pneumonia. And the, I agree that procalcitonin in this, uh, but also the increase in white blood cell count. Can uh, you can not exclude the presence of pneumonia? Yeah. So, so the diagnosis is uncertain. It could be that she has an inflammatory response uh, in, in reaction to surgery. It could be that she's got a chest infection. It could be that she's got a urinary tract infection. Uh, we don't know yet why she's vasodilated with a low blood pressure, but we know that the cardiac index is okay. So we, we're pretty happy about that. And it's consistent with the echo, with the ECG. So we, we think the cardiac status is unchanged from the preoperative environment, yep. So it's uh, now at uh, about 11 p.m. and her respiratory rate is down a little bit. The saturation has improved on non-invasive ventilation. The wheezing has decreased and she's now hemodynamically stable with some vasopressor support. And she's beginning to make some urine with the furosemide infusion. So this is on Tuesday. Now it's overnight, remains stable. Um, on the Wednesday morning, she had a respiratory rate of 20 on just high flow nasal oxygen. <clears throat> She's now mildly delirious. She's a bit agitated, a little bit confused. Uh, she started on quetiapine uh, to help with that. And urinary output is 120 mils per hour and 40 milligrams of uh, furosemide and the blood pressure is still maintained on uh, noradrenaline infusion. The white cell count <clears throat> is 14,000, and the creatinine remains relatively stable. Over the next three days, uh, the noradrenaline is slowly weaned. Uh, the blood pressure slowly improves. She's being covered with antibiotics all of this time, but no cultures grow anything at all. Urinary culture doesn't grow anything. Chest x-ray doesn't show any conclusive evidence of infection. She's weaned off the furosemide over 48 hours as the urinary output increases. The creatinine slowly comes down to near baseline. White cell count is down to 10,000. Delirium slowly improves. And she's discharged on day five without a clear diagnosis. She has a clear diagnosis, right? This is a lady with a very stiff ventricle he, who was massively too rapidly fluid overloaded, went into acute key, uh, heart failure, uh, developed acute pulmonary edema, hypervolemic. You improve the situation, improve the contractility, uh, and uh, unloaded her, and she got better. I so still don't have a that, that is That is true. I guess what I mean is that uh, we, we don't know what triggered the pre-pulmonary congestion hypotension because she was given fluids in response to a low blood pressure and in response to oliguria and acute kidney injury. Now, <clears throat> this could have been to non-steroidals in a diabetic patient, and that's all there was to it, and the hypotension could have been just the inflammatory response to kidney surgery, to a knee surgery. There, there is a syndrome, by the way, related to cement being placed in, in the knee, which is well described as causing a strong inflammatory response. And whether that's what she had or what she didn't, uh, we're not sure. We're not sure. What I would like to say is that some of these cases, however, 
because of the comorbidities, because of the obesity, because of the many other things, independently on the cause that they started with, may have a horrible outcome because there is a kind of growing complication that may start mildly but then evolves into a war syndrome. And in cases of uh, worsening renal function progressively, you may end up needing extracorporeal therapies and so on. So in this case, the outcome was uh, progressively improving and so on. But it's not in all cases like this that you see this favorable outcome. And I'm agreeing with uh, uh, Morgan that uh, the, the inflammatory response must have been there because there was certainly a hyperpermeable capillary syndrome that led probably to at least partial of the pulmonary congestion that we have seen. Yeah, no comment. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, the pulmonary edema that's being described could very well be non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, ARDS from the inflammatory response. And, and so, you know, when you volume load those dry, relatively dry patients, the chest x-ray is going to be relatively clear. But then when you volume load those people, uh, obviously the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema is likely to get worse, which may be the reason why she became uh, hypoxic and went into respiratory distress. So, uh, you know, the inflammation probably settled and the lung injury resolved very quickly. But I don't see any evidence to suggest that this is a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, at least in from what, what's been provided. But, but it's interesting to see how you have a cascade. I, I, I love this thing. You have a cascade. Somebody has a, you know, sort of a seemingly simple operation, but, but in fact, she has quite a degree of renal dysfunction. She's a diabetic. Her EGFR isn't that great. The anesthetist looks at the creatinine. Oh, it's okay. She'll have knee pain. Here, got, here comes paracoxib intravenously, and that leads to oliguria. Then there is a bit of inflammation, and there's a bit of vasodilatation. Then there is hypotension, which compounds the oliguria and compounds the renal hypoperfusion compounds, acute kidney injury, and then the response is to give lots of fluids. Then you get a left ventricle, which is stiff, non-compliant. Then you've got a little bit of inflammatory vasodilatation, but also le leaky capillaries. Then the fluid go into the lung. Then she gets into pulmonary edema. Then she gets hypoxic. Then she gets more hypotensive. Then the kidneys are not... It's a fantastic cascade. Uh, and, and it's kind of like, eh, it could have been stopped by some reflectiveness at the very, very, very beginning. I just, it's an interesting saga. Okay, this is a, a more dramatic uh, ICU. This is a 24-year-old medical student. Uh, this was last month. She transferred to our ICU from another hospital in the city because she has severe hepatitis, rapidly developing acute kidney injury, early ARDS, disseminated intravascular coagulation. After about four days of being unwell with a viral-like illness. In the other hospital, her uh, blood test showed that she had an ALT of 8,500 international units, an AST of 7,800. Her uh, INR is 3.2, the platelet count is 70,000. She had a ferritin level of 6,700, completely off the scale. She arrives, uh, brought in by ambulance with a heart rate of 130. The respiratory rate is 40 on high flow oxygen. She's alert, incredibly frightened. Blood pressure is 90 over 50. The temperature 39. She's got a saturation of 89% on high flow oxygen. The chest X-ray shows evolving ARDS, which has worsened from the X-ray from the other hospital only about four hours ago. So she undergoes rapid sequence intubation. Within about 20 minutes of intubation, she is now requiring high-dose noradrenaline at three mics per kilogram per minute. She's on 100% oxygen, and her saturation is only 88%. She is then started on nitric oxide in an attempt to improve her oxygenation. 
After about 60 minutes of nitric oxide therapy, she's still on 100% oxygen with 88% saturation. A rapid bedside echocardiogram shows a hyperdynamic, well-contracted, uh, well-contracting, slightly underfilled heart. She's then placed within the next 60 minutes on veno-venous ECMO under echo guidance with right femoral vein outflow and right jugular vein inflow. A five lumen central line is inserted into the left jugular and now her saturations are restored to 96% uh, and her ventilation is now low volume ventilation on 60% FIO2. All viral studies are sent off. Urgent EBV testing shows that she's IgG positive. Metabolically, she's showing a mildly elevated ammonia. Her lactate is 12. Her base excess is minus 14. Her pH is 7.1. The urea is 12 millimoles per liter. The creatinine is 190 micromoles per liter. She's anuric, and her glucose is 7. All viral studies return, um, and they're all negative. All relevant bacterial cultures in conjunction with the ID physicians, like leptospirosis, and, uh, Yersinia pestis, you know, all sorts of things that are really incredibly unlikely in an urban dweller medical student are sent off, and they're all negative. She's on broad antibiotic cover with miropenem, doxycycline, and vancomycin, and she's now on R CRT, off the ECMO circuit. A bone marrow biopsy is performed. The bone marrow biopsy suggests that she has hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. She started on methylprednisolone, IVIG, the lactate is 14, and the ammonia and acidemia from her liver failure are controlled with CRT at four liters per hour of exchange of fluid. Hematology suggests that she might be experiencing what is known as a cytokine storm from the hemophagocytic syndrome, uh, and they suggest we should try plasma exchange. How would you do it? Would you insert a double lumen catheter in the other femoral vein? Remember, she has one jugular ECMO cannula, one jugular ECMO cannula, five lumen uh, catheter in the left jugular. Stop CRT and then conduct plasma exchange of ECMO. Uh, that decide that it's all logistically too hard and you shouldn't do it. Uh, one of the problems here is that uh, she presented with the problem of coagulations. Hyper, so that's the problem. That, uh, should be this addressed to the liver dysfunction or something else? So this is really the question. Is there any kind of intravascular coagulation? Yeah, the answer is absolutely. So she has a D-dimer which is off the scale. So she has severe disseminated intravascular coagulation. And we're beginning to see... Uh, peripheral gangrene of her toes. Yeah. I think that plasma exchange should be started. It, I would not modify the CRT because she's severely acidemic and you have the acidosis that otherwise you're not going to be able to control. Um, um, so definitely plasma exchange should be in, uh, done and if not possible of the circuit, you would have to use another Access. The problem is that with the coagulation problem, she's at an extremely high risk of catastrophic complications. So we decided to make a modification of the circuit so that you have off the ECMO a split line, and we did simultaneous CRT and plasma exchange off a Y split off the ECMO circuit to both maintain metabolic control with CRT in this girl that was incredibly sick and attempt to provide therapy. So she was on simultaneous ECMO, hemofiltration, and plasma exchange. Uh, so <clears throat> the diagnosis then was confirmed 
uh, she had a very high CD25, which is almost diagnostic. And in consultation with hematology, we escalated therapy and added cyclosporin and a new monoclonal antibody against CD26. However, despite that intervention, she developed progressive DIC, and now her hands began to uh, gangrene and disintegrate in front of our eyes. Like that, it was 20. The circulation became unsustainable. Vasopressin, noradrenaline, pulse steroids, methylene blue, lactate of 25, progressive rhabdomyolysis, loss of digits from DIC, severe coagulopathy, and after discussion with the family, we stopped therapy escalation, and she died 96 hours after presentation. Could we have done anything else? It was a, it was a terrible experience. Uh, only daughter, Jewish family, um, light of their eyes, it was really amazing. Just saw a woman disintegrate in front of our eyes. Do you think that starting with very high dose steroids, as soon as possible, would have? Probably... So we, yeah. So we did. I didn't actually. She received the first pulse of methylprednisolone about 120 minutes after being with us, because we had the ferritin, which was so high. We had the viral prodrome. We actually made the clinical diagnosis of hemophagocytic syndrome at that point because nothing else fitted. And so we, but we didn't escalate at that point to the monoclonal antibodies and cyclosporine. We, maybe we should have. Uh, maybe it would have made no difference. But we didn't go that way at that time. So she received one gram of methylprednisolone within 120 minutes of arrival. Would have uh, using uh, some uh, liver support system made yep. a difference? Would Mars perhaps helped? It, it might have. Uh, it might have. I mean, event, you know, in the end, she died of DIC. Uh, and, but yeah, that's a that's a reasonable thing. We we didn't go that way. Uh, we but that might not have been an unreasonable intervention. Just a question: What was the complement level? I can't remember. I can't remember. Was, um, yes, um, yeah, I was asking Antonello whether maybe a colizumab or uh, a drug like this could have. Uh... No, M maybe it uh, could be a catastrophic uh, uh, anti uh, anticardiolipin uh, syndrome. Yeah. So the, and yeah, so the, the test DIC for was yeah. well, the hematologist raised that, and we yeah, did all could, the tests, and it was negative. Yeah, yeah. could could be, and DIC was present at the starting. Yeah. And the liver uh, uh, function was uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the spectrum of the, this uh, catastrophic disease. And so could, if the complement was involved, uh, we, we can uh, think to, to use uh, ecolizumab sure. uh, in, uh, in, in this uh, catastrophic reasonable. situation. Yeah, it's very reasonable, yeah. 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 I mean, we, we had a, absolutely, we had lots of discussion about which monoclonal antibody, uh, eculizumab or rituximab. So we looked at the literature and what people had used in hemophagocytic syndrome and what, what there was uh, a greater number of patients with severe hemophagocytic syndrome uh, in terms of experience. And uh, yeah. we, we, we used this monoclonal antibody on the basis of the literature. And in this kind of situation, maybe... Cyclosporin A uh, sure. was not uh, <laughs> could be not indicated because uh, absolutely uh, we have TMA and uh, vascular disease and uh, could be uh, mm. we we understand we understand yeah. we we were in a situation where basically we use a shotgun approach because we were faced with a physiological state that was disintegrated we we understood that that might have been the wrong thing to do. There was a lot of debate. Should we use cyclosporin? We looked at the literature. Uh, there was a joint decision to do it. M maybe it was wrong. Yeah. Did you perform the autopsy? No, the family rejected. Okay. Uh, 
as officer. Yeah. So I'm just curious. The way she presented looks like she had acute liver failure with multi-system organ failure. She's got a dead liver with a glucose of around seven, and whether there was a consideration that she should be managed like an acute liver failure and possibly be listed for liver transplant. So the answer on, is absolutely. The, the answer is absolutely. So w within within 12 hours, we had the liver transplant team and the hepatologist at the bedside discussing liver transplantation and activation. The consensus was that in, in that setting, uh, they wouldn't do it. And whether that's the right decision or the wrong decision, I can't say, but absolutely, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So the, the protocol is we do a four liter plasma exchange over four hours and uh, the blood flow is 100 mils and uh, you can work backwards how much fluid is being removed, about a liter or so, but it, it fully, fully exchanged with plasma, fresh frozen plasma. Yes, but it approaches about one and a half volume of plasma exchanged uh, by uh, kinetics. So uh, could it be better to exchange two or maybe even three volumes of plasma and Absolutely. to, to reach Again, about 90% of uh, actual exchange. So in that girl, we, so we thought the correct complement yeah. and other yeah. So it's, it's possible. Different. It's possible. And again, uh, no one knows, you know, what the intensity of the dose should be under these circumstances. Well, we'll move on to uh, another patient. So again, uh, medical emergency teams go to see a patient in the ward because of a low blood pressure and uh, progressive deterioration of renal function. A creatinine had moved from 90 to 160 micromoles per liter in 24 hours, and the patient was oliguric. Okay, so we go and see the patient. Now let's find out a background of this person. This person is a 70-year-old lady who had received a partial pancreatectomy for cancer of the pancreas a month earlier. So she'd been in hospital for a month. Her surgery had complicated by slow recovery with intra-abdominal sepsis. She'd been depressed. She had uh, needed parental nutrition for the first 10 days. She then had been diagnosed to have a subphrenic collection. She had received radiological drainage of that collection. Candida glabrata had been isolated from her abdominal drains of that infection and collection and she was at that time of treatment with Casper fungin. Over the previous three days, she'd had very poor oral intake. She'd been withdrawn, depressed, refused to eat. Uh, glucose levels had been recorded to be low. Her insulin therapy, which had been initiated after the pancreatectomy, had been stopped. She was depressed. She continued to refuse to eat or drink. And because she was uh, deemed to be dehydrated and to have low blood pressure, she'd had various boluses of crystalloids as well as albumin given for oliguria and hypotension by the surgical team. When we arrived, she was a, uh, a lady with a heart rate of 110. Her blood pressure was 85 over 40. She had a temperature of 37.2. Her respiratory rate was 30. The saturation was 92% on 8 liters of oxygen flow. She had marked pitting edema uh, really up to the top of her chest. Uh, her Glasgow coma score was about 13, 14. She was confused. She had uh, decreased breath sounds bilaterally with dullness on percussion. Her abdomen was soft, non-tender. There were two drains. One that appeared to be coming from under the diaphragm. It was draining debris and pyrrolin type material. And one lower down that was draining serous acidic type fluid. The urinary output had been 5 mils for the last hour and 15 mils over the last four hours. The chest x-ray showed bibasal atelectasis with bilateral moderate pleural effusions. 
we assessed her initially as having acute kidney injury, secondary to unresolved intra-abdominal sepsis, and hypotension, and also simultaneous extravascular fluid overload. What would you do next? I put some choices there, admit to ICU and give albumin, admit to ICU, start a vasopressor infusion, do both, start a furosemide infusion, anything else, comments. Yeah, first of all, I think that uh, is a, uh, I, I need a couple of more uh, things to know. Of course. Was, was the woman on treatment of uh, probably oncological disease still on the chemotherapy or not? No, she had not had, a, she had no chemotherapy yet because she'd been so unwell and difficult. So no chemotherapy. Uh, her albumin, I think, was 19. Yeah, I mean, edema should link it to uh, albumin uh, decrease, and probably clinically, she, I think, she could have all of these of the four things. So albumin. Of course, yeah, you know, all, all of those could be done. That is, that is all true. Yeah, Jorge. So uh, each, this is a critically ill, acutely ill lady with intra-abdominal sepsis. And as a result, has all the consequences of prolonged intra-abdominal sepsis, probably fungemia and or bacterial infection. Um, she's extremely ill, but she's probably too ill not to be explored. Uh, so f from an intensive care point of view, I think that the goal would be to stabilize her and make her able to survive uh, a surgical intervention to resolve, but otherwise will never get better unless we can put in. Uh, so that would include the addition of pressors, uh, adequ uh, adequacy of resuscitation, and then uh, intubation uh, for sure. Necessary, yeah. Absolutely. She needs yeah. to be intubated, stabilized, and then taken to the OI. Very reasonable. Any, any other comments from, from the audience? Okay. So she's transferred to the intensive care unit. So in the first couple of hours, a radial arterial line is inserted to monitor blood pressure. A femoral central line is inserted, and noradrenaline infusion is uh, initiated to restore a better blood pressure. No fluid is given. A variety of measurements are taken. Arterial blood gases, electrolytes, ammonia, glucose, LFTs, and we aim for a mean arterial pressure of 70 millimeters of mercury. So the results of the test come back um, as they're done after admission to ICU. So she has a hemoglobin of 90, a Weissler count of 12,000, a platelet count of 140,000. Liver function tests show minor changes in liver enzymes, a slightly raised bilirubin, an albumin of 19, her creatinine is 250 micrograms per liter, urea is 12, the glucose is 12, she had a sodium of 130, a chloride of 94, a lactate of 2.2, potassium of 3.4, ionized calcium 1.04, phosphate 0.8 millimoles per liter. The blood gases show that she is acidemic, so pH of 7.15, she had a PCO2 of 24, a PO2 of 65 on 8 liters of oxygen, she had a base excess of minus 12, and her ammonia is elevated 145 micromoles per liter. So, question, is her metabolic acidosis due to lactate, high chloride, low sodium, unmeasured anion, strong iron difference? Go back. So, any comments? Claudia, why, why is she acidotic? <laughs> Very good. He was on the telephone. Poor John. Poor John Kellerman and asked him. Uh, so she's, she's interesting. So she, her strong iron difference is pretty much normal. Uh, it's very similar to the normal strong iron difference. Lactate is not elevated. So she appears to have unmeasured anions. She appears to have unmeasured anions. Uh, do we have ketones? That's a very good question. Her ketones are off the scale. They're off the scale. That's it. 30, <laughs> I have never seen ketones that high in 30 years of practice. But it is so surprising that the surgeons were not feeding her. 
Right. It's it's astounding. It's astounding. So we we had a lady who was in a hospital <clears throat> with <laughs> starvation. Uh, it was I, like I've never seen anything like it. Like I'm just wow. Um, so she had profound ketoacidosis, and she was seeking to compensate with her tachypnea and a low CO2, but she could only do so much because she was deconditioned, weak, she had bilateral atelectasis, pleural effusion, she can only do so much compensation. Just, I, I just entered the room, but uh, one little recommendation to the fellows. A lady like this must smell like hell. So if you <laughs> put your nose in the mouth, you can get Fruity make smell. Huh? Yes. yes. Although with the fungimia, we the moved, and stuff. We moved like forward that. since then. We just moved <laughs> your ketones. Thank you very much. But uh, although you move forward. Do your fellows have to taste the urine as well? Or? <laughs> Never forget <laughs> to see the patients. <laughs> very good. I agree. That's, that's fine. By the way, we. Still have only I know, we've got a minutes. couple of minutes. I, I'll just tell the story, I guess. Uh, it's more lucid. The ammonia starts coming down, and the ketones rapidly start improving the respiratory rate and so on. But the creatinine still is, is high, and she's still fluid overloaded. Uh, I'm just going to go through it because Claudius told me I've got one minute. So, what, what should we do? Uh, we, we put her on CRT. And and the reasons we wanted to do that was that we really needed to create metabolic order and fluid control and acid-base control and extravascular fluid management, plural, the whole thing. And uh, we did an echocardiogram to see if she had endocarditis from the candida glabrata, which was normal. We did a CT scan to see if there was additional, with this, in discussion with the surgeon, whether he would take her back to the OR. Uh, there appeared not to be a target, so he, he thought we would wait and give antibiotics and antifungals. We performed CRT, uh, and then we began to take fluid off. And we removed 400 mils an hour while giving albumin to restore intravascular fluid status and facilitate extravascular fluid removal. We then slowly went off the noradrenaline. We took about three liters off. The albumin was now 30, the ketones are gone, the patient is, was awake and able to function okay. And then we started nasogastric feeding. Uh, we continued to take fluid off. Uh, after 24 hours, we're taking six liters off. Uh, and then as the nasogastric feeding started, we started seeing this really strange brown stuff coming out the subphrenic drain which was highly positive for glucose. Exactly. We put methylene blue, and sure enough, there had been an undiagnosed enterocutaneous collection fistula by the surgeon for a month. Exactly. So she needed to go back to the lab. Anyway, so, and we've gone through all of those things. I just wanted to say that we continued to remove fluid, and then the surgeon said, let's wait and continue to drain. Uh, because of her condition, and we ended up nonetheless getting somewhere in terms of improving the urinary output return. She was off CRT, uh, and she actually was able to be discharged from the ICU with a controlled enterocutaneous fistula uh, after we'd removed almost 16 liters, and uh, she was able to go to rehab on day 26 still with an enterocutaneous fistula, but clinically okay. Thank you very much Thank for you. your attention, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Jorge. Thank you very much, Salvatore. Thank you, Claudia.